Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Tamir Siddiqui, bringing you a special Fearless Hour Extra with, that will focus on a chat with Gary Renard and Cindy Laura Renard. First, I'm going to let my co-host and show producer, D. Patrick Miller, catch up with Gary, as they haven't seen each other in a while. And over the years, they've had what you might call a special relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, um, I was trying to remember, you know, uh, Gary and Cindy, how we all got acquainted. You know, I'm getting older, my memory's starting to go. And um, uh, the main thing I can remember is that for three or four years, when I was in a study group in Berkeley, Cindy's mom, Doris, was also in it. And I used to pick her up every week and, and go to the uh, meeting. So I, I think that's how we all met, but I, I keep getting this strange feeling that there was a book involved or, or, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you remember anything like that, Gary? Well, I remember uh, Doris has since moved from Berkeley here to LA, and uh, we are like very close. But it's like the way I remember it. I remember <laughs> sending you the book, and you said, "You know, I think you got something here." And I'm like, "Really?" It's like somebody actually responded. So uh, it was like great. <laughs> And uh, then Cindy's mom, Doris, she used to drive me to the airport all the time. And she used to call that her Gary time. And we used to get into some pretty deep conversations. And I realized then, and I've realized it even more nowadays, uh, that there are people who never would have met each other if it wasn't for you publishing the disappearance of the universe because about a year and a half ago we did this workshop with Doris and me and Cindy. We called it a family workshop with Mark and Jackie, all five of us. And we did this thing and we'd hit a dinner after, right? And there must have been 20, 25 people there. And I remember my friend Mikey Lemieux, I call him Giddy Up Mikey. He said on the way to the dinner, Gary, do you realize that none of these people would know each other if you didn't <laughs> write The Disappearance of the Universe. And when I thought about it, it it's kind of like that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where every you know, thing is connected. <laughs> and I never would have met Cindy, and Jack would have uh, never met anybody, and Mark would have never uh, met Jackie. And it, it's like everything is connected so much. And without that book being published, and you were a major part of that, it's like none of these people would even know each other. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very interesting the way that everything is so connected, the way that, of course, Miracles talks about an interlocking chain of forgiveness. Right. It's like your forgiveness is connected to my forgiveness, and my forgiveness is connected to everybody else's forgiveness. And it's like uh, an interlocking chain, and maybe we don't see the big picture the way that the Holy Spirit does. But maybe as time goes on, we can start to understand more and more about how everything is connected and how we really are one. Yes, yes. And um, it's interesting to me because um, um, my first reaction to, to, to your book was, a little skeptical, as as he, as you may remember, and uh, yeah, I know. And, I read your uh, author's note. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of my favorite memories is when you uh, sent me the manuscript. Um, my initial reaction to it was was uh, somewhat skeptical, and I told you I didn't. I you know only published myself. I didn't. I wouldn't do and wouldn't do this kind of thing anyway. And you uh, asked if I would um, assess it for a fee. And that's part of what I did. So I said, sure, I'll read anything for uh, money. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you answered back, you wrote back, and this is back in the days of letters. Um, you yeah. answered back, uh, good, because you're supposed to read it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, <laughs> and that was interesting. And when I well, got the, I'm gonna tell you a secret, Patrick. Arden and Chris told me, whatever you do, don't tell Patrick he's going to publish this. <laughs> 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 I, 
because it has to be his idea. Well, wow. did you know that, Patrick? Did you know that? <laughs> well, I got the I got the feeling of it when I got the manuscript, um, and you sent it in paper, so it was like you know this tall. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was, wow, it's hard to think of those old days. Yeah, yeah. and um, and I was still skeptical of it, and it, it looked really long. And and after about the first uh, thirty pages. Uh, I, I put it down laughing because I was I was already laughing within the first 15 pages and uh, and it hit me that this book that was too long and that was written in dialogue and that was basically just sort of crazy um, I was supposed to publish it <laughs> the, the feeling came through <laughs> well thank God Patrick and uh, I didn't know that 256 pages was going to turn out to be over 400 in the book. <laughs> you know, I, really, I had no idea. All right. All right. Um, well, I'm going to, it's great to see you guys again. I'm going to duck out here. I'll be back after you do your interview with Tamir to talk, uh, give a little bit more backstory about um, how the course was involved with me even becoming an independent publisher. Because if I had not been one, I wouldn't have published a disappearance. So I will be back, but I'm going to duck out for now and let um, Dr. Tamir take over. Thank you, and, Patrick. And you've thank done you. a lot of other good things, Patrick. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, All right. thank you bye Patrick. Bye. 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 Wow, what a blast from the past. What a blast <laughs> from the past, just taking a step back for a second. What was that like for you? Revisiting wow, the old days. Uh, wow, it makes me feel so good. You know, it, it kind of like takes me back because the book was published about 18 years ago. And it's like, wow, what a great friend. And, and without him, I wouldn't have spoken in 31 different countries, you know, or had that book all, all over the world. It's a, about a year after it was published that Hay House picked it up and they gave me an international audience. And it was like, you know, I just uh, can't picture what my life would have been like, like without Patrick. Patrick mm -hmm. was like, uh, wow, just such an important part of my life. So thank you, Patrick. Wow, that's beautiful. And I'm so glad because, you know, in our times that we have met, I've always thanked you because, as I always say, the disappearance saved and changed my life. And I know after having been part of these study groups going through your books now, it's changed so many people's lives. And so thank yeah. you as well, both of you. Thank you so much. You know, to me, people tell me that, and I still can't believe it. You know, people tell them, tell me that, oh, it's the most important book I've ever read in my life and it's changed my life so much. And it's like, I realize when people say that, that I could not have done that. Hmm. I could not have written that book without some serious big time help. Hmm. And that help was Arden and Cursa appearing as manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. If it wasn't for that, there's no way I could have even, you know, any way done that so i do not even take credit for my books really because there were people that who were not people <laughs> who actually helped me yes. to do that and i could not have done that without some serious help so uh when people say what you just said about what a difference uh the book has made in your lives it reminds me that there's no way that I could have done that. So mm. it, it makes me feel actually a, a little bit humble. That's lovely. And maybe today as we continue our conversations, you know, you just inviting them in and, and creating that space for them to, to speak and to channel through in the way that they have even today, you know, I, I feel their presence with us. And I, I feel blessed to just have, you know, to, to be here with both of you, but also to know that um, they're with us always. You know, love is the only thing that's real. And I'm feeling it now. And I just, I, I feel very lucky and blessed to, to be here with both of you. As we take a step back from the past, and then we just had that blast from the past moment talking about how this all came to be. And we step a bit forward into present day. We appear to be going through a pandemic. 
<laughs> and <laughs> and I, I know. Are we since when? Right? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of reactions. You, the course students are having to this. Course students all over. Um, some yeah. people are saying it's all an illusion. Don't wear a mask. Um, which appears to be maybe a matter of level confusion, um, if maybe both of you could speak to. And then there's other people, most people who, whether they're core students or not, are really struggling right now, are going through this emotionally, psychologically, physically, and there's just so much going on. What would you recommend, or just even just thinking about yourselves, how are you, just as a check-in, how are you doing? How are both of you doing during this time? And also, what do you have to say to those people struggling? Cindy, I'll let you go first. Well, that's a great, I think it is a great question. Um, there's no doubt that this has been a challenging and difficult time for many. Um, we've talked to a lot of people about this, even within our own classes. Uh, we've discussed this. You know, I think it's important. There's a danger in thinking as a course student. There's a danger in and thinking, oh, it's just all an illusion. It's not real. So I'm, it doesn't matter what I do. That is a, a sort of level of confusion. And as course students, we do want to be aware of that, that we're not being asked to deny the world. Right. You know, we can deny the ability of anything not of God to affect our peace, as the Course says, but that, that's the only worthy form of denial. But to deny that there might be people suffering, right, or that people are, are having the experience of having an illness, or even if it's getting COVID or whatever it is, is an unworthy form of denial. So we want to be appropriate and kind with people. And this is what we suggest to people is to remind all of us that we want to be normal. We want to be appropriate. We want to address, you know, the situation normally, but you can do it with a different perspective. Always remembering that mind is cause and that the virus can be interpreted with the Holy Spirit just the same way as anything else can be interpreted with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have to be uh, looked at in a special way. The, the thought system of the course would be the same in dealing with the virus as it would be dealing with an upset in a relationship or any other health issue or some worldly event. You know, so the point is, is that there's always another way to see something, whether it's a virus or anything else. So this is the approach that we take, but while being normal in the dream. For example, if I start to exhibit symptoms of the virus or, some, or have a problem, um, I would have to address that on both levels. In other words, it doesn't mean I don't take care of myself, right? I might go to the doctor, I might right, do something, get rest, take vitamins, do things that I feel I believe are good for me. And at the same time, I remember what the purpose of it is. I can use this for the Holy Spirit's purpose, which is I can shift my perception of how I see myself and start identifying with the part of my mind that can choose the love of God over fear, mm. to choose to see that I'm dreaming this. I don't have to make it real in my mind while I go about doing the necessary things to help myself at the same time. So that would be like, I think a healthy approach using A Course in Miracles. Thank you. you know, this kind of brings up uh, a subject that uh, Ken Wapton told me once. He, he said, Gary, don't forget how to be normal. <laughs> and uh, you look through the course, and most people, they forget the earlier parts of the course because the course is holographic. So it's like uh, it gives some of its most advanced ideas toward the beginning. And if you look on page 24 of the text, it says sometimes it is wise to use a compromise approach in which both body and mind are given equal treatment for a while. So, you know, it's like a compromise. And you almost never hear the course use the word compromise. But very early it says, look, maybe you should do both. And it reminds me of a couple of friends of mine. I have a friend named Dan and a friend named Thomas. And uh, both of them had cancer. And they both really believed that they could heal themselves just with their mind. And they're both dead. And the truth is, unless you're like Jesus, then maybe, just maybe, you should kind of like blend the two. Maybe you should use both your mind and your body. 
and you can relate to this being a doctor, it's like maybe you should do both. Maybe you shouldn't just think that you're on the same level as, as Jesus without getting there. Maybe you should do both. And so I tell people, I say, look, it's okay to be normal. It's okay to go to a doctor. It's okay to have traditional treatments. And at the same time, you can use the power of your mind to even help and facilitate that healing. Mm -hmm. I always, like to, remember, yeah. Sorry, I always go like to remember that the most important decision I can make first before I do anything else, whatever the problem appears to be, is I can choose to see it right with my right mind, is what I mean by that. If I choose to center myself and be in my right mind first before I do anything, then any decision I have to appear to make here in the world will reflect that, be, my being my right mind, and then I, I can trust that whatever I do will be most helpful and most loving in the situation. So, I agree with that totally. The only thing I would add would be, no matter what you do, do it with the Holy Spirit. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, always. Look for guidance in your okay. mind. And you may be surprised, you may actually be led to some kind of a treatment that will help you that you maybe never would have thought of. Right. Mm -hmm inspiration so it's a matter of being miracle ready being in that state to receive thank you for that you know there is a weekly gary renard study book group on facebook we have going and that really does trickle into this next question that you know together we have all come up with and, and many of us facing health issues um so I, I really appreciate that balance between choosing the holy spirit operating from the right mind but also being gentle kind and compassionate in a world that thinks it real um and, and to practice safety of course this next question goes into what you're both already talking about just having this day-to-day -day routine and it sounds like you're already preparing yourself for a miracle readiness state to receive can you get a little bit more into how you create that for yourself and how you how you tend to forgive as often as you do yeah uh, would you like me to start? Sure, good. Okay. Um, it starts. It starts by setting the goal at the beginning, clarifying your goal at the beginning. Meaning, right when you get up in the morning, you can set the tone for the day. Mm. You know, there's a section in the course that I absolutely love to follow and practice, and it's it's called Rules for Decision. And in that section, in Chapter Thirty, Section One <laughs> of A Course in Miracles. Jesus talks about how you can go about having the day you want and what to do when you get off track, how to be in a miracle frame of mind. Mm -hmm. This is, it's a brilliant section. And I actually, this is what I practice. I clarify my goal at the beginning of the day and it starts with remembering I'm not in charge of my day. I turn it over to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please be in charge of my thoughts and my actions today for I would follow you, certain that your direction gives me peace. Then I remind myself of what kind of day I want. I want to experience peace above all else. Mm -hmm. And I want to let the love of the Holy Spirit extend through me so that whatever I do reflects its presence of love instead of fear. And then I, I just <coughs> like to say things to myself like Excuse that. Me. It's not, I don't have the virus. <laughs> I don't have the virus. And I, it's, I, it's, <laughs> it's hay fever. Yes. Right. It's it's great. Clarification. It's great time. Um, always love the joke, Gary. Thank you for that. It's always good to have some humor. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. And uh, thanks for that thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do. I just think it's important to remember that at the beginning, clarify that goal at the beginning, then let it go. You can forget about it. Then, but you're setting the tone. Then, if something comes up that disturbs your peace you kind of, you're more in that miracle frame of mind of reminding yourself what that goal was. You're, you're more likely to stay on track. You have these little reminders throughout the day that if something comes up that disturbs your peace, well, I must have decided wrongly with my mm -hmm. wrong mind and I can choose again. Mm -hmm. And then you, but there's, it's a step-by-step -step process of getting your mind back on track to what you really want. Remembering peace is your goal. And you're more likely to, to get on that train, right? Get on that track when you've started your day that way. And I like to also throughout the day remind myself I'm dreaming. I'm the dreamer of my dream. I do this no matter what's going on. It doesn't have to be something bad going on for me to remember that. I just always remind myself whether it seems to be good or bad, it's still a dream. And I don't have to be attached 
to the dream being the cause of how I feel. I get to decide that. The world mm -hmm. is not the decision maker. Yeah. That's part of my personal wow. process is yeah. that re those reminders um, every day. And it really helps to stay on in a miracle frame of mind. You know, when you have those moments during the day. That's you know, to me, uh, A Course in Miracles is not a lot about rituals. You know, so not that there's anything wrong with rituals. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if it makes you feel good, if it makes you feel comfortable, then fine. And yet there's a place in the manual for teachers that says that God can be joined with in just an instant. So my habit, when I first wake up in the morning and I've gotten into this kind of a habit, I will say, Jesus, you're in charge. And as soon as you think that, as soon as you even think of God or Jesus or whatever you wanna call it, you can call it anything you want, but as soon as you think of that, you are connected. And that's what the course means, that. God can be joined with in just an instant. You can do that just like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to take a long time. And yeah, if it makes you feel good to take a long time, then that's cool also. But it's like when I wake up in the morning, I swear that is my first thought always. Jesus, you're in charge. And as soon as I think that, then I am connected. But if you try to do things on your own, if you try to like be the boss yourself, then without realizing it, you are reinforcing the idea of separation. But the instant that you think of God or Jesus, you are undoing the idea mm -hmm. of separation. So it may be a little bit more important than people think. Mm -hmm. Yes. So maybe, maybe you should just think of God or Jesus. Yeah, and, and when I think of Jesus, I mean, I don't say that in a religious way. I've never been religious, you know. To me, Jesus just is someone who I consider to be a personal friend. And that's actually the Jesus of the Course of Miracles also, because he's speaking to you as a brother. And he's saying, there's nothing about me that you cannot attain. So he's not pretending to be something different than you other than in time. And time does not exist. So he's kind of like reassuring you and I didn't believe that at first, by the way. I thought, what, I'm gonna be like Jesus? I'm gonna be the same as Jesus? And I thought that's impossible. But as time has gone on, I've started to trust him even more and start to be closer to him. And, and I consider him to be a friend. But that's the way that I start my day. I, I just say, Jesus, you're in charge, and I feel connected. Beautiful, beautiful. Sometimes it's nice to remember too that, you know, love is only a thought away. Mm. It's a thought away. We do have to actively choose it, you know, but it, but it is right there in your mind. And by recognizing your mind and not body, you have power to choose how you see and interpret the world and how you see and interpret people. You have that power by remembering your mind, not body. Therefore, you have control over that, over how you how you choose to see anything. And that's, you know, the course talks about that all throughout the course. It's about power of decision, yes. about power of about, about just actively choosing it. Yes. Choose once again. Yep. So how do you do these reminders? Because you both are speaking in such a flow. I, I can't help but feel as if you both are you're coming together as one talking about all this amazing ability to just from the beginning choose god which i think from the beginning at the onset of the day is easier to do as opposed to you know as you go through the day and you make it sound so easy <laughs> you make it sound so easy right it takes actually, practice actually it's it, does. It, it does it does say, yes we um definitely aren't saying it's always easy to do that's why that section I was talking about rules for decision because yes. it's a step-by-step -step yes. process. Yes, you can think, okay, I'm just going to instantly take this away. But sometimes in our experience, it doesn't happen that fast. This is why it takes thought by thought, a process. And you, there's a way to do that. By even not judging yourself, if you can't seem to make that choice in the moment, no. stop and say, well, at, at least I can decide. I don't like the way I feel now, but it's my choice. And when I'm ready, I'm I can choose again. And mm. you're just taking it and you're not judging mm. yourself 
for making that choice. That's even a step when you don't judge it. Right. You know, You're that, I, that idea, Absolutely. Yeah. that idea of choosing yeah. once again, uh, the course says a couple of things about that. First of all, it says that the power of decision is your one remaining power as a prisoner of this world. Mm -hmm. You can decide to see it right. So the course is very much talking about the power to choose. Now, Albert Einstein was asked a very interesting question. He asked, is the human race good? It's a pretty serious question. And I think that the course gives us the answer. When you decide to choose your right mind, the Holy Spirit, yes, Human beings are good, but when they choose the ego, they are not. So we have an incredible range of choice. We can either be very, very beautiful, great, wonderful people, or we can be like Nazis. It's, it's like we can go either way, mm -hmm. but it's all a matter of choice. What part of your mind do you decide to choose to listen to? Do you decide to listen to the Holy Spirit or the ego? Mm -hmm. And whichever one you choose will actually establish your identity. So this choice that A Course in Miracles is training our mind to make, maybe is more important than we realize. Mm. Something just occurred to me too about what could be helpful um, in the forgiveness process, when in the course talks about how important forgiveness is, it's all throughout the course. In the preface, Jesus reminds us too that when we're forgiving ourselves or others, which is really the same, it's all self-forgiveness, but when we attempt to forgive others, it's more helpful when it comes from the place of, I'm not forgiving because I'm trying to be charitable and good. I'm forgiving because what I'm seeing isn't true. Mm. that's true forgiveness i'm not making it real whatever the issue is doesn't mean you're not going to be normal and appropriate in the dream but in your mind you're not making it real you, you remember the truth that what i'm seeing is wholly untrue and it was all made up and this is what i can choose now against being vigilant only for god which is being vigilant against the ego and really really practicing that mindset which then builds and strengthens and reinforces that part of your mind when it's practiced daily and that's part of the process is practicing in your everyday life with whatever comes up that disturbs your peace mm, visualize no right? what it is yeah in the dream it's looked at as all as in the course says it's all the same because an illusion is an illusion is an illusion so forgiveness is seeing it as the same that there's not a hierarchy mm. of illusion there's just one problem and one solution and the separate sense of separation from God is the only problem we need to correct. Mm -hmm. All then other problems resolve itself when we correct that by accepting the atonement. Separation from God hasn't really occurred. And that's part of the attitude of true forgiveness as well. Just remembering that. Tamir, I can tell you something quick. Sure. Uh, when Cindy first came to my workshop, she didn't say anything. She just, <laughs> she just sang one song. And then the next year, she sang two songs. And then the next year, she spoke for like five minutes. Then the next year, she spoke for like maybe 10 minutes. The, the next year, it was 20 minutes. Now she has equal time. <laughs> <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. I, I made it to me. I made it to equal time. <laughs> the next time, she'll have more time. <laughs> I just, I love it. And I appreciate you sharing that because I can't get enough. I'm just sitting and, and listening to you too, which brings me to my, my final question for both of you is just if you have any updates, any updates about maybe this relationship book that's coming along or a TV show and love the idea. I can't wait for it. But if there's anything of that nature, anything you'd like to share. I'll let you go first. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll talk about the relationship book, and I don't know if maybe Gary will share a little bit of that, and maybe the TV project. What's up? I'll leave that up to Gary. But uh, <laughs> um, it's exciting stuff. But yeah, our, I'm excited about completing this book. It's halfway done. Our relationship book. Wow. I mean, we're 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 tackling all angles of relationships. You know. Well, that's um, amazing. Anything someone could possibly go through in a relationship is going to be in this book. <laughs> you 
you know, and within the context, always within the perspective of the, of the course's non-dualistic thought system. But we do get practical. It's going to be, there's going to be practical um, yeah. exercises in this. Yeah. Practical ways of, of, but also, you know, and giving some personal experiences as well. So to, to make it relatable. Yeah. Um, we're not just throwing out, you know, the theory of the course. No, there'll be some good meat, some juice in this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think something for everyone in this. And it's not so much about, um, romantic relationships it broadened to include all all kinds of relationships so anybody can benefit from this yeah. and they don't just have to be course students do they this can be anybody um, it doesn't anybody? have to okay. but it is within the course's thought system okay it's in that Good. context so it helps if you are on that track to understand it a little more but you don't have to and if you're new to it maybe it'll just turn you on to the course if it's something interesting sure. but no there's something in there Oh, that's everyone. great. Yeah. So, oh, I'm so excited. Do we have maybe an idea of when this, <laughs> I know it sounds like you guys are halfway through, which is exciting. Yeah. Um, it, um, um, B, can, what was your question exactly? I just, sorry. Yeah. I <laughs> got excited. I got too excited. Oh, when? Like, yes. Oh, any oh, anticipated when? date? That's, yeah. um, it's hard to say exactly. I would guess putting before. you on the spot. Would you? Yeah. No, it's okay. It's uh, he's guessing yeah. the fall. Wow. Um, oh, I could easily see it ready by the fall. Okay. Um, if, if everything's coming into coming together by then, absolutely, the potential could be in the fall. Could be this year. Yeah. That's great. And I know Patrick stepped uh, stepped away, but is he? Uh, I believe he's your agent again. Is that right? Yeah, Patrick and I have kind of like come <laughs> full circle. Yes where he's representing my fifth book. And my fifth book, since you asked what's coming up in the future, uh, I think that this book is about going all the way home. Mm -hmm. It's about completing the job, finishing the job, actually being enlightened, what it, it feels like, what the experience is, what it's all about. So uh, I think that people are going to be excited about that. I know that I am. Yeah, same. And, and <laughs> then, you know, the book that I'm doing with Cindy, well, it's like I said, it's not easy writing a book about somebody who you actually like. But <laughs> it's like, you know, okay, so I'm doing that. And as far as the TV series goes, well, I don't know. It, it's like we've worked hard on it for 10 years, but I worked hard on disappearance for 10 years. So it's not like it's a big deal. You know, people say, oh, Gary, you know, why isn't this happening? Why isn't this happening? Well, maybe it's not happening because it's not supposed to. Mm -hmm. So things happen the way that they're supposed to happen. And if there's going to be a TV series, fine. Maybe there won't be a TV series. Maybe there'll be a movie. Maybe there'll be something different. Maybe there's something that I haven't quite been inspired yet to actually really make happen. And you know what? sometimes things turn out to just be a forgiveness opportunity and maybe just maybe that's what's best for everybody not just for me but for everybody so if this turns out to be just another forgiveness opportunity for me i think that i can live with that <laughs> i think that i could accept that yes i think we all can too the patrick did he disappear or <laughs> Yes, along with the universe that he published. Um, yeah, he stepped away. He wanted us to, you know, have this time. But I, I just appreciate so much you both being here and sharing well, yourselves. Let me say Thank one. Thank you. Let me say one thing. I, I really want to acknowledge Patrick because if it wasn't for him, my life would have been a different life, and I don't know if I would have been happy. I think maybe my life would have been kind of sad if it wasn't for Patrick and went for me. So thank you, Patrick, very much. I appreciate it. And Tamir, thank you for your, um, gosh, your part in, you know, kind of producing this with Patrick too. You know, it gives people a platform to share and strengthen these thank ideas. You. So thank, thank you for you. what you do. I, I, I have to also, just like Gary did, uh, really allude it to, to Patrick and making this all happen, especially during a time like this when everything is virtual, to be able to come together as one and, and be able to share all of this. Um, it really, yeah, Patrick needs to get back here. <laughs> He'll see this as it is. But 
Um, again, thank you both so much. And I've said it before, I've said it again. Gary, you changed my life. Your books changed my life. And, and I know, I, you know, I've always wanted to meet Arden in person and here they are right now. And it means less to me now than it did before. You know, before I'd be freaking out. I'd be, um, what, is, what is it? You guys are in Cali, right? Celebrity shock or like there's star shock kind of phenomena. And, and there is still like, wow, it's Gary and Cindy, but it's been humbling. It's been humbling to see and to read through your books and to recognize we really are all one at the end of the day. And um, it's just so holy to be part of that, to be part of truth and to awaken together. As well, Tamir, we do live in Hollywood and there are Hollywood people and then there are a few normal people here. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you both? I, I think that we're okay. actually very a normal. Blend to both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a blend of both. A blend. That's great. I think That's we lovely. seem we're pretty normal people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're, yeah. We don't try to. We're not presenting ourselves as know-it-alls or gurus or anything like that. No. You know, we're on the path like everybody else. I love that about you guys so much. It's been such a pleasure and such a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm honored to be your friend. Likewise both of you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hi, I'm back. Um, it was so great to see Gary again. We have not talked in a while. And before we started recording, we uh, were talking about the fact that we have never actually spoken in public together about how the disappearance of the universe got published. So now I want to give you a little bit more backstory um, because there's a very strange way in which A Course in Miracles was directly involved with my becoming an independent publisher who could take on Gary's book. I began studying the course in 1985 and my professional experience before that was um, as a freelance writer with a focus on investigative reporting. So I had not been a student for long when my journalistic background kind of kicked in and I got very fascinated by the story of the course itself and I looked around for what had been written about it and there there was very little um, that was um, objective or very comprehensive. There was a very useful short history that Bob Scutch wrote called uh, During Without Distance. It was key to my early research, but it was not uh, journalistic in nature. In other words, it didn't try to cover the whole story, uh, uh, the critics of the course and how it spread and so forth. So I set about uh, writing a series of articles that covered those subjects. Those articles eventually led to a book idea called The Complete Story of the Course, um, which was not intended to teach the course, but to tell the, the, the story of its uh, coming about and some of the controversies that surrounded it at the time. That book was sold to a major New York publisher, and everything seemed to be going fine. I got some advance money to do the research. I completed the manuscript. I turned it in. It was edited and accepted, and was on schedule for publication when the publisher of this very big New York house called me and said um, that he had just fired my editor, the woman who bought my book, and wanted to let me know that he never really liked that editor and he didn't like my book either. And that if they were not already committed in terms of having paid the advance um, and put it on the publication schedule, that he would have canceled it. Um, all this was uh, uh, quite unsettling. So I asked him what the situation was now, and he said, well, don't worry. We're going to, um, we are going to kick it back by six months, and we're going to uh, give it a new title and do some rewrites so that it's, uh, it sounds more like Marianne Williamson. Now, the reason for that is that this was the mid-90s, and Marianne Williamson's uh, first book, A Return to Love, was very popular, and publishers uh, like to go with popular trends. Um, 
in the course of my research, I had met Marianne and considered her a friend. And so I told the editor that I, I really thought that Marianne did the best job of sounding like herself. And she might not uh, take too well to a book under my name that was trying to sound like her. So I told him that unless they could return the complete story of the course to its original schedule and not touch it since it had been edited and accepted, that I would have to pull the book. Pulling the book means breaking contract, that, and that means I would have to pay back my advance, and uh, it's not a real good reputation in publishing to be a contract breaker. Um, and that was emphasized to me when the publisher responded by saying, um, you break this contract and you will never be published in this town again. And by this town, he meant New York City, the center of American publishing. Uh, to make a very complicated story simple, I did pull the book, tried to shop it around with my agent, um, and indeed no one else would touch it. Um, once they learned that it was a book out of coming from a broken contract. And that is how I ended up becoming an independent publisher and doing the edition of the complete story of the course myself. This is that book. Some of you may remember that. Um, so that was uh, 1997 and that put me in the position six years later of being able to receive Gary's manuscript and take on his work. Uh, the complete story ran, f uh, had a pretty good life. Um, it eventually earned back all its money. It had cost me and uh, was uh, reaching the end of its lifespan, eight or nine years old, when I was um, offered a new contract by an independent press in Berkeley named 10 Speed Press. They wanted to see the book um, updated, revised, and built out a little bit. They wanted to see more material um, about the course itself. And that turned into this book. Put it over here. <laughs> Understanding A Course in Miracles, which came out in 2008. Now, ironically, uh, just a few years after it came out, Tin Speed Press was acquired by Crown, uh, a big house in New York, and Crown was in turn absorbed into the monolith known as Penguin Random House. And so, ironically, I did get published in that town again and with the same book. And yes, I really thought about calling up that editor and letting him know, but I didn't. <laughs> um, so Understanding A Course in Miracles had a pretty good lifespan. It was published in 2008. In 2018, uh, Penguin let me know that they had run out of their printed copies. It didn't plan to reprint because sales were slow and um, that I could have the rights back. So I got them back um, and I got everything that I would need in order to reprint the book if I wanted. But it didn't really seem... Um, appropriate. It didn't really seem like a good time for marketing and revision. And the book in its first form and its second had lasted 20 years. That's a, that's a good record for any book. And then Marianne Williamson, who has uh, strangely influenced my life at a distance several times, um, decided to run for president in 2019. And she was very much in the news for a full year, from January of 2019 to January of 2020. And that meant that the course was very much in the news. And even to the extent that the New York Times did a fairly substantial feature article on the course, in which they called it an esoteric Bible that has now gone mainstream. And I, when I read that, I heard a little click and realized I need to do this book one more time. So for about the six months, last six months, I've been updating and revising Understanding A Course in Miracles for a second edition. It will be out sometime in May. 
And um, at this point, you can actually um, advance order a signed copy if you'd like. You just go to my website at dpatrickmiller.com and you'll see the links. Um, and I swear this will be the last time I do this book, but I think it's probably got another good 10 years in it. So that's the full story of how the Spirits of the Universe came to be. Uh, thanks to Gary and Cindy for jumping in on the interview and to uh, Dr. Tamir, as always, for her um, wonderful presence in these interviews. And we'll see you next time.